Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. If you guys haven't subscribed, please subscribe and hit the bell. This allows me to provide you guys more free content. All right, so today I am very excited. I have Amber O'Hearn with me and we talk about all things carnivore. She is a data scientist. I hope you guys find benefit in this interview. We talk about vitamin C and fiber and what she eats in a day and all this good stuff. And most of all, she is a veteran carnivore. She has been doing the carnivore diet for over 10 years. Okay, let's get right into it. And I am very excited today. I have Amber O'Hearn with me. She is a meat-based advocate and she has been doing carnivore for a very long time. So I don't think I need to introduce her to many of you because I'm sure you already know her. So let's get this started. Amber, thank you so much for being here today. If you don't mind introducing yourself and explaining sort of why you started the carnivore journey. Sure, yeah. I have been on a carnivore diet for a long time now. It's been over 10 years and I had been on a low carb diet that wasn't carnivore for over 10 years before that. So it's been a really long journey. What had happened was I, both times that I started, a, when I started a low carb diet and when I started a carnivore diet, it was for weight issues. And initially, the low carb diet solved my very modest weight issues that I had had as a young adult. And um, I was able to just maintain that for a long time. And I was excited about the science because it was, it was different from the other nutritional science I had heard before then, and I really delved deep into the science behind it and thought it made a lot of sense. So it was perplexing to me then, having had all that success and knowing a lot of the science behind it, to discover after many years that my weight was actually creeping up again, even though I was on a low-carb diet. Right. and. I had had a couple of pregnancies and hadn't lost all the weight in between those. And so by the end of 2008, even though I was on a low carb diet, I was almost 200 pounds. I might have actually reached 200 pounds. I kind of got so discouraged I stopped weighing myself. I'm 5'6", so that's quite a lot for me. Okay. Um, it was about that time that I found people on the internet from the uh, Zeroing In on Health forum uh, who were doing a plant-free diet, which they called Zero Carb. Um, I was always a little bit unhappy with the name Zero Carb because it caused some confusion. Really, it just meant eating only from the animal kingdom, as we would say. Right. And I thought, well, there are a lot of people there who seem to be having have have had the same struggles that I've had and then had success. So it it is a thing that I could try. <laughs> and it seemed really intimidating at the time. Um, it's really very simple to just eat meat, but the idea of having a plate that had just meat on it when I was so used to having salads and low-carb vegetables seemed really uh, like a big change. But I I decided I would do it just for a few weeks and see how I felt. And my idea in my mind was that I was really thinking of it like we think of a diet, you know, like I'll do right. this as a diet to get back to the lower weight and then I could just maintain it again with low carb because the weight gain took many, many years to accumulate so I figured I could at least maintain for a little while. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, so I tried it in, in January of 2009 and it was just astonishing how effective it was going from an already low carb diet. I started losing um, a pound every other day. Wow. <laughs> it was so uh, it was so effective, and of course that was very pleasing to me. But the thing that ultimately has kept me on the diet all these years is that it also put to rest another problem that I was having that I didn't think was related to diet, and that was a mood disorder. I had had depression symptoms. I was diagnosed with a major depressive disorder when I was 20. And in my 30s, I was re-diagnosed to a form of bipolar disorder, bipolar type 2, which has uh, depressive symptoms. And then 
you don't have true full-blown mania with psychotic breaks, but you have a kind of lesser version of that called a hypomania. So I was on a lot of different drugs trying to solve that, and it was actually getting worse and worse and worse. And all of that came to a halt when I took plants out of my diet. So that's why I'm here 10 years later still on this diet. Wow, that's amazing. Um, what did you eat on your low-carb diet? So was it kind of keto or was it less, I mean, a little bit more carbs than that? I would say typically it was 30 grams of carbs a day or under. Okay, wow. So what do you think was the differentiating factor of just the 30 grams versus just going all meat-based? Well, I did initially think of it like that as just being drastically lower carbs. Mm -hmm. But these days, I don't really think that's the the biggest factor. I think that wow. plants themselves have something that I'm reacting to in a negative way. Okay. From what I'm hearing from you, what you've healed on carnivore is you had some weight loss. And how much weight did you actually lose? So initially, I went from over 195 pounds down oh. to 130. Okay. And, okay. or it, it might have been 135 for a while. The okay. first, the first, I don't know, 60 pounds or something were really quite quick. Sure. And then it, then it took longer. And I reached my lowest weight in, I think, 2014, which mm -hmm. I kept for about two years. And I've subsequently gained. 20 pounds from there and I don't exactly know why because my diet hasn't really changed there may be some other factors um, so it depends on when you're talking about but what does a uh, day of eating look like for you um, do you count calories do you count macros um, how much meat do you eat in a day it's really varied because it's been a long long time so sure. when I was initially losing weight there was a period for about three months when I meticulously tracked everything. It was after I started, but okay. the purpose of it was to, I just wanted to know, like, what is what does it look like? And at that time, I was eating between 2,500 and 3,000 calories a day, and that was while I was losing. And mm -hmm. it was basically, my my go-to at that time, I think, was... I, I did eat a lot of steak and a lot of ribs, so mm -hmm. it was mostly beef, but but I, I didn't really limit myself to beef. I had chicken, I had pork, I had burgers, I had, um, I, I typically ate twice a day. Sometimes it would be bacon and eggs. Okay. Dairy, dairy is something that I seem to be okay with in limited amounts, but if okay. I make it a regular part, besides a bit of cream and coffee, and I do drink coffee, to okay. be completely, you know, clear and transparent about that. Um, but for me personally, I find that I can have a bit of cream and it doesn't affect my whole, uh, my weight and my um, my diet. But if I eat something like cheese and yogurt in particular, I, I seem to have some kind of addictive response to it where I... I, I want to keep eating it even though sure. I know at some level I'm not really hungry. And the test for that might be like, do I want a steak? No, I only want cheese. <laughs> so it's it's not actually hunger, it's something else. All right. No, I, I totally experienced that. And lately I've been overeating dairy, especially during the holidays. And I think it was my kind of swap for carbs. And mm -hmm. I definitely gained a little bit of weight because it's so easy to overindulge on dairy. And I think even like sausages, bacons, like all the are the dried meats, I'm sorry, the the dried sausages, the, you know, like the beef jerkies, like those are also easy to really overeat too. Um, so do you count calories now or macros now? Every once in a while, I, I will do some experiments that sure. involve knowing what I've eaten. But mm -hmm. no, I, I have a strong, a strong idea that if you have to count calories, then your diet isn't giving you the proper signals that it should be because in in an ideal world mm -hmm. you eat food and when you have had enough for the uh, a proper weight and um, health for your body you will stop being hungry and so if you have to 
intervene with that in some way. It indicates to me that there's something going on about the food that is interfering. So I agree with that. Uh, but what I find interesting is, so a lot of people ask me, well, my uh, my mind and kind of digestive system, that um, that relationship is broken. And so when I first start carnivore, I can eat and eat and eat and I'm eating like four pounds of meat a day and I'm still... Um, I still feel like I can eat. And so what what do you attribute that to? I attribute that to uh, eating too low fat, actually. Okay. Uh, protein, the, s- protein doesn't have the satiety properties that fat does. And I think that for a lot of people, especially if they're post-diabetic, um, the eating a certain amount of protein will start to lean you back toward a a more glucose based metabolism mm-hmm. and then it perpetuates itself because you need you need more you, basically what happens is you start using the protein for energy because you're not getting the fat for energy sure and so a lot of people find that if they um if they make sure that they're choosing foods that are high in fat and one thing one trick that you can do to help figure this out is try to eat the fat first and you will you will get to satiety faster. So how many how much meat do you eat in a day typically? It really varies a lot. There was a long time for a long long time I think one and a half to two pounds would be about where I was at. Okay. Um, these days I I sort of get into different foods for a while and, and so it kind of depends what I'm eating. If I'm eating mostly steak I would say it's the it's maybe one and a half pounds if I'm eating so recently <laughs> I I started making a custard that is made out of cream and actually uh, lamb brains okay. and um, so I was eating two cups of that a day for a little while um, there was a period where I was eating a lot of pork belly and mm-hmm. I, I, that probably came out to less volume sure. wise. <laughs> right. And there's a lot more fat in pork belly as well. I think it's, yeah. yeah, it's a lot more fat. Okay. And do you add any fat to your meat? Not typically. Um, if I'm eating something like salmon, then yes, I'll load it up with butter. Um, okay. But mostly I'm just choosing cuts that are fat enough that that they're getting me that satiety. Okay. Okay. Do you eat anything that's non-carnivore other than your coffee? Do you ever have like cheat days um, in the 10 years or more that you've been doing this? Um, I, no, I've never had cheat days. <laughs> but from the very beginning, there were a couple things that I would have on occasion. And I, w- I still have those from time to time. So we're talking like once every couple of months or something. And those items have been... Um, a square of dark, dark chocolate or 100% chocolate, for example, um, a pickle, a dill pickle from time to time. And the other thing that I, I will almost always do if I go out for sashimi, mm-hmm. I, I will have the soy and wasabi, okay. and sometimes I'll have a little bit of the daikon with it. Have so you those are any- typical things. Okay, have you had any reactions with those? Uh, when Not you go to this? any of those. Oh, no. okay, okay. I... I waited and nothing happened. <laughs> sure, sure. No, that, Whereas that's good. I've had, I've had sausages at other people's house that had a lot of garlic in them, uh-huh. and that really caused bloat, bloating and discomfort. So I try to avoid garlic and onion and those kinds of spices. Right. What about salt supplements, electrolytes? Do you need to monitor your electrolytes? Do you add salt? Uh, do you use any bit of supplements? Did you use it before, like within this ten-year span? <laughs> well, when I first started the ZC diet, I interpreted um, no spices as meaning no seasonings whatsoever. So I didn't even use salt. And the first week or so, it seemed very bland to me. Mm-hmm. But as the week progressed, I actually became quite used to not having any salt. And I basically oh. don't salt my food this whole time. Um, 
Wow. I'm very now. I'm very sensitive to it. So if I go, for example, out to a Brazilian restaurant, mm -hmm. uh, fogo de chao or whatever, they really salt their meat quite oh, heavily, yeah. and I can eat it. It's okay, but I th I would I think I still prefer without. Um, I have at times tried supplementing salt in water to mm -hmm. see if it would give me some benefit, but it didn't seem to. Okay. As to other electrolytes. I have had periods um, where I've gotten leg cramps again. Okay. Which I associate. I always associate it with keto adaptation, sure. or with periods of intense weight loss. But mm -hmm. um, in point of fact, it seems to me like I, I never really figured out why I was having those, and I really upped electrolytes for a. Uh, for quite a long time to try to deal with that. Ultimately, it didn't help any of the electrolytes that I tried. Okay. Um, so, so that's something I've played around with, but it's not something I'm doing right now. Okay. Have you ever tried um, topical magnesium spray, like directly sprayed on your calves before you nope. go to bed? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I highly recommend, recommend it. it. Um, it's, it's kind <laughs> of like an Epsom salt bath in a bottle. And, mm -hmm. um, Magnesium is best absorbed through the skin, so it doesn't have to go through the digestive tract. Um, and so I have, I've had some clients that um, the muscle cramps um, improve a lot because of the magnesium spray, because you know magnesium allows your muscles to relax. And so that might be it. There are some people that that's not the reason though. So, but yeah, definitely try the topical spray. I'll send you a link for it. Thanks um, for the tip. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, eating nose to tail. So it seems like you're one of the veterans that actually does eat organ meat. Um, so what is your opinion about, you know, there's a lot of veteran carnivores that you know that um, they don't really eat nose to tail. Uh, what is your opinion on the whole kind of movement? Do you need organ meat for a carnivore? It's a complex question. <laughs> um, I think that there are some myths around it and um, there's a lot more confidence around what we know than I think is really warranted. Sure. So okay. eating nose to tail um, I think is a little bit romanticized. So we think oh all these traditional cultures if you look at them they're eating all the parts of the animal so it must therefore be necessary. This must be something that we've we've carried as knowledge as a kind of like evolutionary thing. Um, I'm not sure that that's a warranted idea because okay. first of all, looking at all the traditional cultures that are around us now, obviously there are traditions that you wouldn't want to attribute to um, need. For example, there are, uh, bread is a, a great tradition. <laughs> um, Another problem with it is that you can't tell if somebody, if a culture is eating something, if they're eating it because they don't have a choice and sure. it's a question of should we throw this away or should we eat it? Um, and the, the availability of, of animals has changed a lot um, mm -hmm. through, the, through the millennia. That we're now at a point, when agriculture started, we were at a point where the large animals that we had been hunting for a very long time were all becoming extinct, almost certainly due to us hunting them down. Right. And so, so we, we were in a bit of a crisis um, where the foods that we were typically eating weren't available. And so if you just look at at the agrarian societies or even the hunter-gatherer societies and look at what they eat, it's not necessarily a great representation of what um, we were eating in the past. So our needs might be um, <clears throat> skewed by that. Okay. So <clears throat> that said, of course, it's absolutely true that many organs provide nutrients that are harder to come by if you're just eating muscle meat. So in particular, liver is this powerhouse of of all these different nutrients like folate and, and vitamin A and um, different B vitamins and minerals that would be harder to get if you're just eating muscle meat. And we know that some of those vitamins are really important. Right. So the question then becomes, 
if you look at the observation, if you look at the long-term carnivores who have been eating no liver for 10 years, <laughs> why are they not getting sick? Right. Um, and I think that we need to take that idea seriously. There, right. there could well be um, a change in, in metabolic uh, nutrient interactions that make, it, that make it so that they don't need the intensive nutritional um, components that you would get from eating liver. And then the other thing is not, you can, not all organs are the same, right? So right. There, you could, you could be eating lung and brain and, and spleen, and that's going to give you different things from eating liver. Right. And, and so I think there's a, there's a lot that gets um, lumped together when you say sure. you need to eat organ meats. That's fair. I did a graphic a while ago, and I think the most um, advantageous organ meat was liver, and then I think it was kidneys. But other than that, some of them had similar nutrients to beef, or just, I mean, I'm sorry, muscle meat. And so I, I completely agree. It's just interesting because, you know, a lot of people are coming into the space saying that you have to eat organ meat, then where are you going to get, for example, your calcium if you're not eating bones or bone broth or, you know, um, um, blending up eggshells or, you know, that type of thing. But yeah, um, sometimes it's, I guess it makes more sense to keep it simple. Um, as a nutritionist, it's just, it is hard to deny the fact that organ meat, I mean, liver specifically has so many nutrients. Um, so do you try to incorporate or do you just go by taste? I just let my hunger be a guide actually. And with liver in particular, I find the same pattern happens a lot every once in a while. I'll get a craving for liver, oh, wow. and I'll buy. Uh, I will buy a a bunch of it, and I will cook it, and I will eat a lot of it, and then um, I'll usually cook more than I can eat, and the next day I'll eat a little bit more, and then the next day I don't even want to think about liver. Like it's just it's not disgusting, but it's completely unappetizing. All right. And my sense is that there are some nutrients that might be getting topped up. And and I think it's important to acknowledge that there are vitamins like vitamin A and copper, for example, that are in liver yes. that you could get too much of. Right. And um, following your, your instinct on that is probably a good idea. Yeah, that's good. It sounds like you're very, very um, able to, you know, mindfully eat and you have that intuitive eating where you can now trust your body. Um, did you always have that or when did that start really working for you? Because that again is one of the biggest things that people have a hard time. So they just ask other people, how much should I eat in terms of meat? Because I don't have that connection with my brain and gut yet. I guess I never really stopped trusting that. Even when I was overweight, obviously there was something going wrong and yeah. and maybe you could say my appetite was dysregulated. Okay. But I don't know. I, once again, I feel really strongly that if my body's asking for it, there's there's a reason for it, even if there are other problems that my body is dealing with down the line. Um, uh, my my answer to how much should I eat is always until you've had enough, <laughs> until you, you stop feeling hungry. Right, um, right. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, so I'm just going to push this a little bit further, but I know some people, they'll say, well, my body craves chips or sugar, and so then should I be listening to that? So what are your thoughts on that then? Yeah, it's, it's about... Um, choosing the right foods and then not limiting within that set of foods. So I, I do acknowledge that there are certain foods that seem to send signals that downstream dysregulate the ability for your body to do that properly, but I don't think that meat is one of them. Okay. That's fair. I, I, I agree too. Um, so I know you touched upon coffee, so you do incorporate incorporate it you don't see a big I know you did sort of like this kind of experiment where you did away with coffee did you feel any different during that time I didn't so I I have quit coffee twice since I started carnivore okay. once was for about a month and that was going fine and then I started a new job and <laughs> yeah. I uh, 
I don't know, just uh, one cup and I was right back into it. The second time I was a lot more purposeful about it because I really wanted to give it a good chance. I know that there are phytochemicals in coffee and um, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that sometimes we think we feel great and we don't realize how bad we are feeling until we make some change and, and realize how actually good we could feel. And I thought, I really should give it a, a fair fighting chance to see if removing coffee would make me feel better. So I quit it for three full months. Okay. I guess that was last summer, 2018. Um, so two summers ago. And I didn't notice any difference so I brought it back <laughs> what about your energy did you notice a difference at all in your energy um, having the coffee versus not having the coffee well certainly in the first couple weeks but actually that's not quite accurate because this this time when I quit coffee I realized that tyrosine is an excellent um, remedy for caffeine withdrawal oh, okay so I didn't really have the huge exhaustion that I had the other time that I quit coffee um, and it just took about a week to kind of readapt. I, I've experienced, um, I've experimented with removing coffee too and I think the first week I had all, like those muscle aches. I don't know if you experienced that at all but it's like I no. could feel the caffeine leaving me. It's it's somewhat <laughs> co uh, common to have that as a caffeine withdrawal where your body feels like it's going through a physical flu. Um, and then I would get those those caffeine headaches. But after a while, um, the biggest thing I noticed was my mood was very, very leveled. So I woke up and I didn't have that, oh, tired, I need a cup of coffee. It was just, you know, I just woke up and I was ready to go. So that was a difference for me. But um, I think the one benefit I have from drinking coffee is I do have that up kick in energy at first. And so that's kind of how I got back to coffee. But I think Overall, I actually like not drinking coffee, but I can't seem to get off it right now. So. Um, well, there's something else related to coffee that I've realized recently. I've been playing around off and on with um, very high-fat carnivore oh. diet, which I've been calling Keto AF for Ketogenic Animal Foods, okay. kind of a joke name. But um, the point is to try to make a diet that is both based on animal foods like a carnivore diet but where you where you actually deliberately try to get the ketones very right. high as if you were doing a therapeutic ketogenic diet so okay. the the basic idea is to eat um, fat to protein by gram at a two to one ratio which comes out to about eighty percent by calorie right. and I find that when I do that mm -hmm. my caffeine tolerance goes way down and so um, Within a few days of doing Keto AF, this has happened on multiple occasions, I will be drinking morning coffee, and after one to two cups, I, have, I just cannot drink it anymore. It just it's really turns me off, and if I persist, I will get caffeine jitters oh, wow. it, at, at a much smaller level of coffee than I would normally drink. And I find that really fascinating. I'm not... I'm not sure why that would be yet, but if I'm, it seems to me that if I'm in deep ketosis, I can't tolerate as much coffee. So what about, and then what about dairy? So I know you said that dairy doesn't really bother you that much, but um, a lot of people end up, um, what I noticed is when people transition from keto or even the standard American diet to the carnivore diet, a lot of people lean heavily on cheese. And so they end up eating a lot. And then they're like, why am I not uh, losing weight? Why am I so constipated? Um, so what are your thoughts in general about dairy with the carnivore diet? I think when you're trying a carnivore diet, dairy should be somewhere between zero to minimal. Okay. Because it it's that disruptive. What you you really want for a carnivore diet to be based on meat. Yeah. And if you're relying very heavily on dairy, um, I just think you're less likely to succeed. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. What about uh, blood work? So in the you know period you've been carnivore, have you received any blood work? And then if you have, I mean, were there any markers that were kind of abnormal or you know anything concerning? 
Um, I didn't for quite a while, and, and unfortunately, I don't have befores. And even if I had befores, I wouldn't have had before low carb because sure. that was literally the 90s. Okay. Um, and I, I didn't have the finances to really consider doing it on a on a regular basis. Sure. But uh, so the first one that I had that was a comprehensive blood work was in 2013 so that was some four four years after I had started a carnivore diet okay. and already at that point I had the profile that if you have looked at the cholesterol code in the work of Dave Feldman and Siobhan Huggins have identified this profile of the lean mass hyperresponder so I, I had lean mass hyperresponder okay. um, values at that point and pretty much every time I've tested a lot more in the last two years okay. than I than I had um, ever in any other period in part re influenced a lot by Siobhan and right. this um, deep and dive interest yeah so um, there were a couple times where one value or other would dip to the borderline level but I've always had this um, profile, which is very low triglycerides, very high HDL, and very, very high LDL. I understand that some people might be concerned with the LDL. I am not because, um, well, first of all, a long time ago, I looked into the, um, the risk factors and what you could learn about heart disease based on different um, lipid profiles. Sure. And all the evidence to me looked like LDL was not really an important risk factor if you know your triglycerides are low and your HDL is high. Mm -hmm. And so I've never really worried about that. Um, and now, of course, we have so much more information about about it that it's... Um, it's becoming a, a really heated topic of interest. Right. So, although I can't, of course, tell you that it isn't a, <laughs> a risk factor, I strongly, I strongly doubt that it is. Sure. So, what numbers would you say is considered high LDL, low triglycerides, high HDL? Um, this is not my expertise, but... My triglycerides, I think, are typically under 80. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Um, can't remember my HDL numbers, but they're probably around 80. And wow. my LDL is, I'm sure, surely in the 200s. Okay. When I last looked at Dave's work, um, I think anything under 100 for triglycerides is considered good. Um, and then I think for LDL... Um, it really depends on where your HDL is. So if your LDL is high, but your HDL is, I don't know, like in the 40s or 50s, that's probably not ideal. But that's sort of what I saw too. And But like you said, this isn't, I don't think people should take this as medical advice, but just kind of, you know, what we believe in. I'm on the same page with you. I'm actually a lean mass hyper responder as well. So when I was vegetarian, my cholesterol numbers were great. Um, they were, my LDL was, you know, in the 100 somethings, my HDL was decent and my triglycerides were low, but at the same time I was suffering with major depression. So, you know, I, you know, yes, I had great cholesterol numbers, but, and now my LDL is high, but I mean, like you, I'm um, again, I'm a, I have the LMHR numbers, but now I never struggle with depression. So I'd rather take the high cholesterol and not have <laughs> my mood disorders. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. It's not even a conceivable option for me to go back to the depression. <laughs> right. No, no, I, I totally understand. Um, so wh when you were first starting, did you have any concerns about removing um, like all of the fibers in your body, the um, any of the carbs or, you know, like how did you, how were you okay with just going full carnivore and, you know, not having any fiber? Well, Part of the comfort was because I was considering it to be just a temporary thing. Right. That's right. <laughs> so I wasn't thinking about any long-term consequences. It wasn't until I realized how good it was for me that I thought about 
you know, is this going to be okay? I was already not very persuaded anymore that fiber was very important. Right. Um, but I was pretty, I had been pretty convinced that that plants as just as a category were something that we needed, but I didn't really have great ideas why. And so this, sure. then I started really studying um, what they were doing and how necessary they were. And I, I just turned up nothing over and over again. There's just no reason to be concerned about it, especially in light of the fact that we have um, in, in recent memory cultures that were eating very low plant and very low fiber diets. Right. So that's one thing that put me at ease. When you did your research on plants, um, I mean, what is your sort of kind of take on anti-nutrients, um, just plant survival? You know, if you can kind of give a brief, um, like, opinion on that. Sure. Well, I think that some of us, um, maybe not explicitly, but have this notion that that plants, plant foods and humans sort of go together in this symbiosis mm-hmm. where we're... I don't know, we eat them and they, I don't know, uh, when you think about it, we're not really providing them any benefit, except insofar as if you, I suppose, when you're farming a, a plant, that plant gets to live. But right. but if you think about the long history of it, plants don't want to be eaten any more than animals do. Right. And any plant that it, that that allows itself to be eaten, it's it's major parts of its of its body and in particular its reproductive parts isn't going to survive to the next generation and so all of the plants that are still on earth today are here because they managed to figure out a way to defend themselves and they don't run away so there are some physical barriers that they might have like bark for example or thorns even but almost all plants the, the vast, vast majority are, are poisonous, <laughs> like deeply poisonous to us. Some of them are only mildly poisonous to us. And the ones that we eat on a regular basis that we've domesticated, we've kind of bred to try to reduce the poisons as much as possible. But yes. we haven't completely gotten away from, from that. Um, so plants are basically full of phytochemicals which are evolutionarily functioned as a way to poison their predators so that they couldn't eat them. And so I don't think that the level of poisons that are in most plants that we eat today is harming most people who are healthy. So, I mean, it would be ignoring the evidence if you said that people can't eat plants, because right. obviously we have been. But I think that something has happened to a large minority of people where their tolerance for different plant compounds has been greatly compromised. And I'm definitely one of those people. <laughs> and right. one of the reasons might be that something about my ability to detoxify or my ability to defend myself from from uh, letting those toxins into my body has broken down in some way so that they're affecting me in ways that they shouldn't. So I have an upcoming book where I write about plants and their toxins. And one thing that I firmly believe why a lot of us are starting to not find the benefits of plants, but actually feel more of the adverse effects is because our guts are a lot more damaged from various you know, processed foods and you know, a lot of the foods like the grains and uh, beans and or seeds and uh, nuts that are breaking down our gut with the, you know, phytic acid and the lectins. Um, and then on top of that, as we're using plant foods that have a lot of um, glyphosate, which also destroys our gut, I think all of these kind of combined with the anti-nutrients, um, the phytochemicals separately, I think it also does even more damage as our gut becomes a lot more permeable. So it's, um, it's just, it's fascinating and it's also very frightening that these plants have these type of, you know, they can cause war in our bodies. With all that said, do you think then that this way of eating is for everyone or just these, the population that cannot handle vegetables or plants? Well, I, I think that it's probably not harmful for anyone, but I I definitely think there are people who don't 
need to avoid plants to the degree that that I or other people that I know might need to. Okay. Uh, one thing that is interesting, as we were talking about earlier, sometimes you don't know how good you can feel until you try something. Yes. Um, that's something that <laughs> some people that I know, many people I know who tried carnivore and didn't really expect to get much out of it suddenly realized that they felt so much better um, that it was it was really mind opening to them. Um, whereas I, I've actually met a few people who tried the carnivore and said, ah, I don't seem to get any extra benefit. And so lucky oh, that's them. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. I feel the same way. Um, I, I interviewed one of the veterans, uh, carnivore veterans, and they talk about what you just talked about as zero carb Zen. And, um, I'm fully in agreement with you. A lot of my clients that were not carnivore prior and then they try it um they talk about benefits that they never realized were issues you know so right. like oh i have more energy or um, i'm not as moody in the afternoons or or my menstruation has um balanced out like just little things that they thought was somewhat normal in life um and so i don't think people like you said will experience it until they fully try it and so that's why i'm always an advocate of people just at least trying it even if it's just a temporary diet just to see if there are any benefits because I, I believe likely there will be. So let's shift gears and talk a little bit about vitamin C. Um, a lot of my graphics, I, I, um, I quote your source of basically how you talk about a lot of the vitamin C and glucose, they use the same receptors. And so maybe we don't need a lot of the vitamin C because there's less glucose, so there's less competition for these receptors. Um, and I've looked into it and that's very true. It makes a lot of sense. But uh, Rhonda Patrick, I think she's one of the ladies that said um, there are other vitamin C receptors that has nothing to do with uh, glucose and these are for other parts of the body. I think her point is you actually do need more vitamin C than we carnivores believe. Um, and so I just wanted, I was just curious what you thought. Yeah, I have a few things to say about that. So the, the competition with glucose and that form of vitamin C mm -hmm. is um, much more of an issue for people who are diabetic or have right. metabolic syndrome, right? So um, they're going to have higher circulating blood glucose, which is going to interfere with vitamin C uptake. And so sure. so the point about that is that there are some people um, who have contributed to the RDA of vitamin C who mm -hmm. say we should add all this extra because it might be helpful for metabolic syndrome. And the point okay. here is Yes, if you have metabolic syndrome, you might have vitamin C issues. But if you address the if you address the high blood sugar by going on a low carb diet, that's not going to come into play. And so that excess buffer of, of vitamin C that our RDA is like tr probably triple what you need to meet your basic antiscorbutic or against scurvy needs right. um, is probably going to disappear. So I I, I really don't think that. Um, the argument that we should get more vitamin C in order to, to try to prevent heart disease is a good argument. Um, but if you're talking just about a low carber, they're, they're going to have a normal amount of glucose. And, and in some cases, as you might know, sometimes uh, baseline glucose will actually go up a little bit. So you could almost use that as an argument for needing more vitamin C. Right. Um, but, but there are other reasons that uh, besides the glucose competition, that vitamin C doesn't seem to be as necessary on a meat diet, and and I think we need to we get a little bit confused because in the early 1900s we started discovering all these vitamins and um, sort of mapping them to diseases that we didn't realize were diseases of were deficiency diseases. So we have rickets for vitamin D and we have uh, we realized that the component that is missing when you get scurvy is vitamin C. Right. Um, but that doesn't fit very well with earlier data that um, had been discussed, discussed quite extensively even 200 years before that where um, it was recognized that if you ate fresh meat you didn't get scurvy. So there is something about meat itself that is preventing scurvy and it 
even though scurvy is a disease of lack of vitamin C, um, meat doesn't have that high a value of vitamin C. It has some, and there's sure. already this big confusion <laughs> saying yeah. that meat has none, which comes from the the USDA database reporting that it has none, but without even it was just an assumption. They didn't even look. Um, but beyond that, um, one of the properties that I think might be um, the key or a key to why meat is uh, lowering the need for vitamin C is because it has it's full of carnitine. And there, there are two basic um, things that vitamin C are, are really essential for. Well, there, there are more than two, but two things that, that vitamin C aids in the synthesis of. One of them is collagen, which is in all your tissues. And as far as I can tell, eating collagen does not help yes. with collagen um, in your tissues. Um, by, just biochemically, it doesn't work out. And I have some references on that. But carnitine does get incorporated directly. And I'm pretty certain that if you're eating a lot of carnitine, it's going to reduce the need to make as much, which could reduce the burden of need for vitamin C. But then a third thing that I think is really important and often overlooked is that we haven't been vitamin C synthesizers for a very, very long time. It, so most animals make their own vitamin C in the body. So for them, vitamin C isn't a vitamin because it's just something that they make. Sure. And what happens in um, animals like us that don't synthesize vitamin C, um, many of us, including humans, also don't um, break down uric acid. So we don't have uric case. And that means our uric acid levels are much higher and what happens is that uric acid seems to have taken over uh, another function of vitamin C, which is to serve as an antioxidant. Mm. In animals that don't synthesize vitamin C, the uric acid to vitamin C ratio is much, much higher than those who uh, synthesize vitamin C and um, eliminate uric acid. And so it seems to me that we often are using these um, cross-species analysis and comparing ourselves to animals that that make their own vitamin C. In right. fact, I think if you look at Linus Pauling and other big advocates okay. of vitamin C, what they're saying is, look, we have this, this um, faulty system that doesn't make vitamin C, so we need to make up for it and get ourselves to the level that we would be at if we were synthesizing vitamin C. But that's a really flawed argument because our, our species has completely flipped the roles of uric acid and vitamin C in certain senses. And so there's no need to try to bring our vitamin C up to match that of uh, an animal that is unlike us in that way. Sure. One thing I'll add to to all of this is if you have gut issues and you have excess vitamin C, that can actually contribute to um, um, higher oxalates in the body. And like you were talking about with collagen, we don't necessarily digest collagen. We um, uh, we digest the hydroxy. Oh, I forgot what it's called now, but. Um, and that ox um, that pathway can also go towards making oxalates in the body. So. It's funny because, I mean, like you said, the RDA, um, they doubled the amount that we needed for vitamin C recommendations. And, you know, there's no, it, at least in the RDA book that I've read, um, there's no logic of why they decided to double the amount. But I suspect it has something to do, like you said, with the diabetes um, becoming a lot more rampant. Like, for example, with... Um, with um, our needs for amino acids, I, they did a very similar cross study and why, you, you know, our daily values for certain amino acids, they basically one way they figured it out was they broke down what the um, amino acids are in breast milk. And that's how they sort of came up with the RDVs for adults for how much different amino acids we need. And so I don't know, like you're saying with, you know, when we're comparing our uric acid and vitamin C needs with animals that already synthesize their vitamin C, are we doing justice in general with all these nutrients by comparing it to, you know, like 
infants that with breast milk, um, I get breast milk is very ideal, but does that equate to our amino acid needs and all the different, you know, proportions in, um, you know, adults? It's, it's just something I think. Unlikely. Yeah. So (laughs) I think it's just something that we should look into more than say, oh, these are RDVs and that's fact. And that's what we need to hit because I don't necessarily know if that's true or correct. Um, One other thing about vitamin C uh, that can be detrimental is it is a a powerful antioxidant. And if you take enough of it, it's actually going to interfere with oxidation, which is, we tend to think of oxidation as bad. We think of oxidative stress, but it's actually really needed in a lot of processes. It's it's a fundamental process of, of making your own oxidation and then making your own antioxidation just enough to to deal with what you need. If you put a lot from the outside, for example, there have been studies that show that adding a lot of vitamin C prevents the necessary adaptation that happens when you exercise. So it prevents your muscles from t- getting the benefit of the exercise. So yeah. really, we, we have to be careful with messing around with things like that. <laughs> no, I... I agree. I completely agree. So let's talk a little bit about CarnivoreCon. Um, I know that you are the founder and, you know, it was, I, I personally went last year and it was amazing. It was so great to see the speakers and, you know, learn a lot about the science behind why carnivore or meat-based diet is so important for us. Um, do you want to l- talk a little bit about CarnivoreCon, what's kind of happening in 2020? I know now it's gone from one day to two days. So if you want to talk a little bit about it. And when Thank it you is so much, yeah, it's it's um, Memorial Day weekend in May, so May twenty third and twenty fourth. It's going to be two days because we just we had so many good speakers last year, and it, we, as you may remember, we barely had time to go to the bathroom between talks because there was so much going on, and so I wanted to have uh, um, more time and more leisure and more food, <laughs> and more speakers, so. That's what we're going to do. This year, we decided to have a few keynotes and also take submissions on talks. So um, I can already tell you that Dr. Georgia Ede will be speaking again. Megan Ramos will be talking about how she's been using carnivore in some of her um, fasting clinic patients. And Diana Rogers will be talking about her documentary, The Sacred Cow, which I'm really excited about talking about um, environmental aspects of farming. And then the other speakers, I can't reveal anything yet, but they will be announced in February. Okay. That's exciting. The barbecue was so delicious. And I remember all the guests were telling us how good the meat was. And I mean, the speakers were great. It was, um, it was a wonderful experience. And I recommend everyone to definitely go out and see this, this conference. So um, as we're wrapping up, do you have any recommendations and guidance for people that are wanting to delve into carnivore? Um, maybe some advice in general? Yeah, I do. Um, One thing that I would say is don't take it too heavily. Like if, if you give it a a good shot and um, do it for a few weeks and take care to eliminate all the factors that might be interfering, you stand to learn something. And what you do with that knowledge is completely up to you. So I guess what I'm saying is, Don't worry too much about, I I couldn't do this forever because you don't have to, you don't have to think about that right now. I mean, it does sound very intimidating when someone like me comes on and says, oh yeah, I've been eating this way 10 years. I never, ever set out to eat a plant-free diet for 10 years. I set out to do it for three weeks and, and see what happened. And then, and then the choice for me became really obvious and, um, if, I think if you worry too far ahead, that can that can make it hard to to stick to something. So so one is just um, just make it easy and light. Um, um, the second thing is do um, do everything you can to make it as clean and um, uh, un 
conflated as possible because if you're going to go through all the effort to change your diet to this degree, um, but you don't take out spices or you decide to have um, something off the diet three days in, you're just not going to, you're not going to learn from it and it's a waste of your time. That's really good. I really like that. Um, I think a lot of people try to go hard and then for a few days only and then they dabble with something else and they're like, yeah, it's not really working for me. So I think if you go in, I think if you go in very strict because it's already a kind of strict diet, um, I think you will feel the rewards much quicker and you'll feel them to then decide what you want to do. So I think that's really, really great advice. Thank you. Um, where can people find you? Are you on social media, um, your websites, um, if you want to share them? And then I'll also link to them in your the notes. Thank you. Yeah, I spend far too much time on Twitter. My handle there is Keto Carnivore. And uh, that's the ma my main social media outlet. I have a couple of blogs, which I'm in the middle of consolidating. And I'll get the new URL to you when that's ready. Oh, okay. But for now, um, I have them on separate sites. So we have uh, ketotic.org, where I initially started writing only about um, reviews of scientific work about the ketogenic diet. And then I had empiri.ca, so em Empirica, for more um, experimental stuff that I was thinking about, but didn't necessarily have the same kind of scientific rigor behind it. And then I I'm writing a book, and I'm releasing it chapter by chapter online, and that's at facultativecarnivore.com. Okay. Do, do, I think you wrote um, like a beginner's guide to carnivore, because I've seen it kind of float around, and everyone says it's so good. I think I looked into it, and I didn't get to fully read it, but what, where is that as well? So then I can also link to that. There are two possibilities of what you're talking about. One I wrote in 2013. It's okay. called Eat Meat, Not Too Little, Mostly Fat, yeah. and it's on my Empirica blog. And it's uh, I wrote it with my ex-husband Zuko, okay. and it was it's just a very it's a very brief guide of how to get started and why you might do it and how to do it. Okay. And then the other beginner's guide is something that I co-wrote with Raphael Sartoli on okay. his uh, Nutrita yes, blog. Yes, that one. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so and th that one it explains what does that exactly explain? It just uh, it also goes more into depth about uh, what a carnivore diet is compared to other diets that you might do like keto or paleo, and addresses some basic concerns about uh, nutrients, about fiber, and the microbiome, and um, and how to do it and different varieties. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. I'll link to both of them. I read your blog post one, the one that's eat me um, when I first started carnivore, and it was very, very helpful. I think when a lot of um, you veterans are, you know, basically say, calm down, <laughs> take it, be really simple and just eat meat. Don't worry about all the frills. I think it makes it so much more simpler than kind of how we're complicating a lot um, lately, I feel like. So thank you. Um, I appreciate this. This was very helpful. I'm sure a lot of people that are watching will appreciate um, all the content and your anecdotal story as well. Um, well, thank you for your time. And uh, yeah, I'll um, have this out soon. Thank you so much, Judy. It was a pleasure okay. talking to you. Yeah, it was good talking to you too. Bye, Amber. Bye. All right, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you guys get a lot to take away, but I hope the big thing you take away is that the RDVs and the RDAs are not something that are that simple of a process. We don't know for sure what our bodies need. So ideally, if you have no symptoms, no physical, no mental symptoms, and you're eating a nutrient-dense diet, I would trust your body and not worry about all the nuances. Make sure to subscribe and hit the bell. I will talk to you guys next week. Eat a lot of meat, take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. All right guys, I will talk to you soon. Take care, bye.